Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're joining us tonight for Wisdom from Our Neighborhood, the Tuesday night conversation of Path to Understanding. Path to Understanding was formerly the Neighbors in Faith and also the Tracy Levine Center. Uh, our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. Um, tonight, we're, we have a really exciting panel tonight. I'm really so happy to see uh, some new faces, but also Hannah, my friend, um, Tallulah, who's part of St. Mark's Cathedral. And Tallulah, I know her, her grandparent, her, her Dave, who is, who's, I hope, watching tonight. So hi, Dave. I um, need to say hi to give a shout out to Dave. And also Jacob, who's part of Herzl Nair Tamid Synagogue. Hi, hi, Jacob. Thank you for joining us. And then, and then also Hannah Hotchkapel, who's the program director of Kids for Peace uh, International. And we're so happy to have Hannah with us tonight. So uh, I just want to start off, you know, during COVID-19 here by just asking how your families are doing. Uh, Jacob, how about you? How are, how are folk, uh, folk doing these days? Um, I would say within our family unit, we are doing well. I think there's definitely some anxiety, um, but nothing, nothing more than, than we can sort of overcome together. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, Tallulah, how about you? Um, we're, we're doing okay. My mom works at Harborview Medical Center, so she's not a nurse, she's a social worker, but she's still kind of in that frontline area, which certainly makes our lives a little different than other people's during quarantine. Yeah, but you worry about her just a little bit, don't you? Yeah, and it's certainly crazy to be working at a hospital right now, so Absolutely. lots of stress. Absolutely, lots of stress happening for everyone there. Yeah. Yeah, and Hannah, how are you and your family doing? Um, we're doing well. My husband and I are working, both working from home and are grateful to be able to do that. And um, just navigating having family and friends all over the country and the world and just checking in on them and trying to make sure that we're staying connected amidst a lot of the unknown that is to come. That probably gives you a really interesting perspective about how COVID-19 is, is kind of rolling out in different parts of the world, how different governments are responding. Um, Anything that you've, you've, you've kind of picked up from that that you want to talk about? Um, it's fascinating. Uh, I, we don't all, I think, have a lot of bandwidth for, for research, but if you have the time to just look and see and read about those experiences, it's definitely worth it. It is simultaneously completely universal and unifying that everyone is experiencing this moment um, in history, and yet also... Um, the country you're in matters, the state you're in matters, um, the, the community that you exist in and the, the existing inequality and conflict in that community um, impacts the way that the community is, is um, behaving and the way that they're responding. And so um, though there is that universal piece to it, it's still fascinating and, um, and just really um, kind of heart-wrenching at times to see how various places are, are responding. Well, you know, Hannah, that's a challenge that I'm going to take on um, this week. I'm, I'm going to go do some research and listen a little bit more about how different countries are responding and some of the challenges within them. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. So, um, you know, we just concluded, uh, you know, uh, Passover week and also uh, Holy Week here for Christians. Um, I'm wondering how your faith communities adapted to uh, to this new situation in their uh, in their different, you know, community gatherings. Um, I can certainly speak on that. I go to a cathedral, and so it's it's the big place. Everyone goes there, especially for Holy Week. It's a really busy time, and so we've been live streaming services. And our Easter service was actually on Cairo Seven on Sunday, um, and I think that they have made a really like a very they've done a very diligent job to to keep the service as accessible as possible which i really appreciated i find i found these live stream services fairly emotional um to to see this coming together from all over the place on sunday the website that we do our live stream through was completely like there are so many people on it that you couldn't access anything on the saint mark's website um which was crazy and not great if you're trying to access the, the live stream, but certainly a testament to how people come together in times like these. That's great. And Jacob, how about you? I you know for my own personal faith engagement, it has been um, a little bit difficult. Um, for me, um, where religion really connects, 
um, is, is, is through the community that the synagogue and my faith offers. Um, and while the virtual um, sort of like the seders, the virtual gatherings I have done, done, I would say a fairly, fairly good job of like, um, of, of, of presenting the faith service. Um, I am personally having a difficult time sort of with the personal connections um, that, that, that Zoom and sort of the, the, the online style um, sort of has a difficulty incubating. Yeah, I can see that. Um, so you, you really enjoy then that kind of, you know, deep connection, saying hi to somebody, greeting different folk. That really means a lot to you, it sounds like. It does, the little side conversations you have with the person you're sitting next to. Um, and, and that's, I feel like that's missing in a really, really essential way. Yeah, Hannah, how about you? What's, uh, what was it like for you this last week? Um, it was different. I have spent, so I grew up the daughter of, of two Baptist ministers. I have spent most of my adult life employed by churches. Um, and working in faith communities, and I, I still do um, in, in, in various ways. And so um, this is the only the second time in my life I have not attended an Easter Sunday worship service um, and is the first time um, in a long, long time that I have not had um, responsibility and the need to kind of be present all of the time doing things. Um, and so I have kind of found this kind of bittersweet moment of being able to be very quietly taking in Holy Week in a way that is very different than my normal experience. Um, but at the same time, it's, it is my favorite week of the year. Um, and I've really, really, as Jacob said, missed just those patterns and habits that you have in your community. And um, last year, so last year, a bird got into our church in the midst of our Easter vigil on Saturday night. And our seminarian chased it out. And like, you don't have those experiences when you're live streaming a church service. Um, something that most people didn't even notice was happening, but a few of us kind of participated with, with brooms and, and opening doors to, to get the bird out of the, out of the um, church. And so it's just, it's that type of just thing that doesn't even have to do with, with the, the holiday or the tradition that you miss right. when you aren't able to be with people and be, be in your community. Yeah, because because over over digital kind of communications, isn't it like human moments are are like you know technical difficulties? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Instead of just being human moments that we all kind of kind of like a crying baby, right? Uh, in a worship service is is a human moment. Yeah. Um. But but on on Zoom or on TV, it's it's technical difficulty and somebody made a mistake, right? Right. And in person, it, it's sweet and cute and memorable. And, and when you're online, it's frustrating because it's taking away even that little bit of connection that you're able to achieve. And... I certainly have missed those more human aspects of the Holy Week services. So like I'm a chorister. We always sing at the Easter Vigil. And my choir director has strawberries, Cool Whip, and cubes of cheese that she passes along for all of the little kids who never stay up that late. And that's really fun. Or like going to hide Easter eggs at the end of communion because so many people have to get communion. Like those things that I really have missed experiencing this year. You know, I was, I did a, a Good Friday service on Facebook Live on Friday at noon. And, and that in the, in the Episcopal tradition, it's a very, there's a lot of words. There's a lot of readings. And I was the only one reading. And so what I asked them to do was, to remember through all the years that they've experienced Good Friday, to think of all the different voices that have read those readings. And so that when they grew tired of my voice, they could remember the previous, you know, people that they had heard, you know. So I do think that there is a durability to that kind of relationship. And yet, um, and yet we miss it, I think, profoundly when we're not able to, to experience you know, sitting next to someone and having some of those moments uh, that are so powerful. I attended um, a, a virtual Seder on, on Sunday evening with a friend and I go to his Seder every year and it's just, it's, it's really sweet. His parents come to town, um, yeah. but none of that was able to happen. And so um, we were commenting on how there was sadness in the difference, but also um, there were people all over the country who were able to join because it didn't require travel. 
and it didn't need um, it didn't need us to be in that same place, but yet we were able to do it. And um, he pulled up the the Haggadah, the 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 book or the the prayers that are used for the Seder um, every year in the Jewish tradition, and he highlighted pieces and asked different people to read different pieces. And um, it was just this very small and sweet, inclusive way of of navigating that. And I was appreciative of the thought that was put into it. Yeah, in a, in a world where 50%, at least in the United States, where 50% of people are chronically lonely, mm-hmm. you know, I think I think faith communities, you know, can play a real powerful role in, in, in reducing some of that loneliness. And I think, as Rabbi Jim Morrell said a few weeks ago um, on, on our conversation, it's an opportunity for us who aren't always chronically lonely to have a taste of what it's like and then reach out to more consciously to folk who experience that. Um, So Tallulah, how many years have you been part of Kids for Peace and of all the things that you might, you know, spend your time doing, why do you do this? Um, I have been a part of Kids for Peace since I was 11. So that's six years. I'm 17 now. Um, just a pretty long time when you're 17. Um, and I love it so much. I love it because of the people. I think that there are many other things that I could do, things that are solitary and things that are with the people that I go to school with. Um, but I have access to so many people from all over Seattle, all over the country, all over the world that I've managed to, to be friends with and to have experiences with, to learn with, that has really made this an invaluable experience for me. And Jacob, how about you? So I joined Kids for Peace three, four years ago, something like that. Four years ago. Four, four years ago. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and for me, it has always been a unique place in the intimacy of community. It has been able to form. So there are some like really, really core parts of my identity, my faith, my gender, um, how I engage with the world um, that I often don't feel comfortable talking about with even some of my school friends because it's just not the environment where talking about those things are the cultural norm. But Kids for Peace has done a really intentional job of creating a community where people feel safe to feel vulnerable, people feel safe to feel emotionally uncomfortable. And because of that, I've been able to share and explore these key aspects of my identity um, in greater depth than I any than I ever otherwise would have. I, I see you I see you nodding, Tallulah. You wanna you wanna say anything else that, that about what Jacob just said? Um sure. I just it is the most the most comfortable place to be uncomfortable, if that <laughs> makes sense. Um it's has always been the place where I feel I can go first for the questions and uncertainties that I have about things that are not just like, you know, school related or friendship, like the big global questions that we all tend to have, I have felt most comfortable pondering them in this space and being okay with being wrong. Wow, so it's hard to be wrong though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So what is it about the environment that's created there that allows that kind of vulnerability and that that capacity to be wrong, right? And to and to have a community kind of hold you in the middle of that. Like what 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 is it that makes Kids for Peace like a, that that create a community that's able to do that? I think we the way that most of our friendships are formed, like it's very distinctive to start with a summer camp and you get to know someone really well with a summer camp, right? You're rooming with them, you eat all your meals with them and it starts this bond that is immediately deeper than anything else you would get in a week. Um, and I think that makes it so easy to to be not right, maybe not wrong yet, but not right. Um, 
and to be a little bit more yourself than you would in most situations. And then you just build, we do so much building on that, so much community, relationship building, things that we just do together that make us stronger. And we all take the leap of being wrong together. And that makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. Jacob, anything you want to add? I would say whenever you have a group, whenever you have a community, there are certain norms of engagement that define how people interact with each other. And at Kids for Peace, we are very intentional about framing those norms of engagement. So like one of the first activities that students engage with each year is forming a group constitution, beliefs that we want to live by and not just sign on to, but really live by. And I think some of those, like the, the sense of confidentiality within this group, this, this sense of like excess, um, accepting other people's ideas and respecting others' beliefs are very explicitly stated um, in a way that, that makes people comfortable sharing um, aspects of their identity that they otherwise would be afraid um, would be judged. Wow, that's, that is beautiful. That's, all, that's hard work though. And then I wonder a little bit, I was thinking about you know, the, the, the concept of being wrong and then having this sort of group constitution that you talked about. I think I got that, that term right. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that means that there's occasions when any, any one of us or every person in the room maybe, uh, maybe does something that's, that, that they have to be called out on. Mm -hmm. um, do, does that actually happen in your groups? Yep. Yeah. It's, I think it's the best lesson that we can learn as a group and the hardest lesson is being able to call out people that you love um, because we do really love each other and Part of that is saying, this was not okay, what you did, and this is how we're going to go forward with it. You know, Jacob, anything that you want to add there? Um, if, let, let me think about this one for a moment. <laughs> That's just fine. That's just fine. That's a tough question. So let's, let's talk about the organization just itself for just a minute. So Hannah, um, you know, how did Kids for Peace get started? And um, and basically, like, what what do y'all do? And I just want to let everybody know that there's a and a button if you're watching on Zoom, and you can start to give us some questions that I'll, I'll grill people with in just a little bit. But uh, so tell us a bit about Kids for Peace, Hannah. Um, so Kids for Peace is an international interfaith youth advocacy organization, which is a lot of buzzwords to say. <laughs> Um, that we are a group of um, humans, youth and adults um, that work globally around the world um, to be empowered to create more peaceful communities. And we do this um, in a variety of ways and we are led by the youth that we work with, um, with their ideas, their understanding of the world, their um, willingness to do the hard work of um, being vulnerable, of making mistakes, um, and um, we exist as an organization that allows youth and adults to wrestle with that together um, in a way that makes us all better at engaging with our communities. Um, so Kids for Peace started in 2002. Um, it actually started originally in Jerusalem, working with Israeli and Palestinian youth. Um, shortly after the organization began, um, it grew to have chapters and spaces in America where it was doing work. Um, so we have um, groups around the United States, obviously including here in Seattle, um, that do work. And our work is deeply local and deeply global all at the same time. Um, and so the, the youth that we work with and the, the times that we are together, um, we are talking about our local community and we're looking around us and finding the voices that are not heard um, and acting always as, as allies and as people who, who lift up those, those communities that most needed in that moment. Um, and use our, our time and our energy to um, learn from one another, to understand one another, um, and to be um, empathetic and compassionate to one another. Um, and at the same time, we understand what's going on in the world. And we know that each and every one of our experiences is different based on where we live, who we are, every aspect of our identity makes us unique um, from the person next to us. 
Um, and yet being able to, to do that in a way that is deeply, deeply connected in these relationships that Jacob and Tallulah talk about um, locally and, um, and around the world. And they're not kidding when they say they have friends all over. I mean, they, um, I very consistently find, find out tidbits of things that are going on elsewhere in the world, not because I read them or heard them, but because they are told to me by, by people who have friends in other places. <laughs> Wow. So, so in a way, you, you all have kind of a Kids for Peace has kind of a process that you engage in in terms of listening, and and who gets listened to and how the group begins to form its its identity and its its sort of uh, mission and what it wants to do. So you have more of a process than you do have a program. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Um, I think it's both and. I think okay. you know we have the structure of our program that allows us to like function and have some order to, to our world. Um, sure. And yet every single thing that we do it is about the process. And I mean, the, in many ways we often will say, I think I was joking with Jacob about this the other day is that the debrief often is much more important than the activity that you engage in. Um, it's how you're talking with one another. It's how you're learning from one another. Um, it's how you're hearing about how the person next to you experienced um, that activity. Um, and it's also recognizing that each one of us um, really truly can only speak for ourself. Um, and when we talk about our experiences in the world, um, we are talking about our own experience in the world. And, and we can share the stories of others in a way that amplifies voices and identities and communities and allows them to be heard. Um, but we are doing just that. We are sharing something that has been given as a gift to us um, in, in being able to hear those stories and hear those messages and learnings and wisdom. Wow, and so that, that kind of takes me back to something Tallulah said and, and Jacob as well about how, you know, um, part, of, part of it is, I, I, what I'm hearing is sort of a, a dedication toward some notion of, 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 of truth in the broadest, more mysterious sense, right? And then also a dedication to relationships with people around us which means in a way that like that the, like we're not in the center of everything, right? And, but I think a lot of times what happens, what I see happening a lot of times in the media is people saying, well, I'm on, I'm on this team and you're on that team and we're right and you're wrong, right? But you're really trying to create a whole different kind of atmosphere, which, which must take some real work to, to, uh, to, to create. It must also be a lot of fun. It's okay. Oh, I think it's really fun. I think it's really fun, but it also gets to be my job. Tolula, what were you saying? I was going to say, I think people are fun. And so when you're doing things with people that want to be there, it tends to be fun. Yeah. So, um, so what have you all learned about other faith traditions, you know, in the, in the process of, of, of engaging with the, both the experience of other people and with some of the, the, the teachings of those traditions. Um, have there been some things that, that you've learned about them that were interesting to you? Um, I have found the intersection between specifically the three Abrahamic faith traditions, but really most um, faith traditions that I've interacted with to be a lot, there's a lot more intersection between them than I ever expected there to be. Um, I think that we turn to these wisdom traditions because we want answers to the big questions. And so everyone tries to tackle that the best that they can and learning the different ways that people answer those questions um, has really been fascinating and been interesting to then look back on how I answered them for myself. Interesting. And Jacob, how about you? Has there been some interesting learnings for you about other traditions? I would say um, there's a certain universality of connection. Like for so many people, regardless of faith tradition, what they believe about spirituality is a deep, deep, deep part of their identity. And recognizing that allows you to connect with someone on that really, really deep level. And, and not just 
build a bridge across maybe a common interest, but build a bridge across something so deep, so fundamental to who they are mm -hmm. that it can serve as a gateway for engaging in conversation about topics that are maybe more difficult. Like if you can form a connection with someone about some um, shared sense of spirituality, even if it's not the same religion, that's your foundation for talking about politics. That's your foundation for talking about race. That's your um, foundation for, for talking about ethics in areas that people may, may be much more likely to, to disagree. Um, but it's important, it's important that we're able to find connections and bridge, bridge across those divides. Oh, Hannah, is there anything you'd like to, to add about that topic, about learning about other traditions? It's really fascinating to watch and to 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 just walk alongside as it happens. I think um, you know some of my some of my favorite stories of of Kids for Peace and and just of this of this work that that we do is watching as people discover and watching as people walk into a space that feels completely foreign to them um, and leaves seeing that actually a lot of it made sense and a lot of it felt similar, even though it might have looked very different. Um, and, and none of that is to say that we are choosing to um, dismiss the, the uniqueness that each of our traditions holds. Um, and I think that is something else that I love watching is the, the kind of people, people as they come into their own about how they speak about their tradition and how they're able to, to really talk about their own practice as their thing, it's, it is theirs and they can speak about it and talk about it um, with joy and excitement, um, but also equally desire to hear that from other people and to recognize that there is space for more than one thing to be true. And there is space for more than one thing to, to be um, meaningful and life-giving in the world. You know, so I, I, I wonder as well at the same time that you're learning about them, like, you know, what I've heard, what I heard in all three of you is you're learning certain things about yourself as well. So how does engaging with, with someone else's tradition, with a person from another tradition, like, what does that do for your own connection to your own tradition, to your own community? But Jacob, would you go first, maybe? Um, could we actually circle back to me if that would? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, how, right. about, how about, let's pick on Tallulah now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, some of the most like formational moments for me in faith have been the experience to teach other people about how I interpret spirituality. Um, and then in turn to see how other people want to share that with me, um, has made the whole experience much more personal. Um, and I think that it has helped me develop my sense of, of self and of spirituality a lot just by experiencing the teaching process and the learning process and that kind of thing. That's great. That's great. I know, I know, I know Tallulah uh, Bishop Rickle, you know, fairly well. And I, I remember him uh, telling everybody uh, early in, early in his days of being Bishop that, that like with, with, perspective to the creeds, the Christian creeds, um, he, see, he told people, if you don't have any questions about it or struggle with it, then you're not, you're not doing it right. And I, and I wonder sometimes if, if when you engage other, other, uh, other folk from different traditions, if you don't sometimes come back to St. Mark's and go, hey, why are we doing that? Like, you know, if, if you don't have like a deeper, like kind of, kind of questions for your own faith in the middle of that. Yeah, that, that's definitely something that I have, I have experienced. And it's kind of, it's funny, like, I, I've worked in religious education for years. I've, you know, you teach the three-year-olds about the Trinity right. and like, everything is fine. Right. Then you get a bunch of high schoolers in a room and they're like, ah, tell me about this Trinity thing again. Like, who are these people? What does that mean? And I, you know, and my, my three-year-old explanation doesn't work anymore. <laughs> like now I have to actually think about like, what am I saying? What am I explaining? And, and, and why do I believe it? And why is it a core piece of, of who I am as a Christian and, and, and the way that I talk about my faith? And um, so it definitely is, it, it makes me both question and also um, learn to articulate the way that I understand faith um, better when, 
20 teenagers are staring at you being like, I don't get it. Like, I don't understand this, this, this concept. Um, and you have to be able to, to speak a little bit more articulately about that. Right. Um, I would say for me personally, um, there's like, there's this really deep sense of pride that accompanies being able to share this part of myself with other people. Like when I wear the kippah head covering in my own synagogue, it's a sense of connection. But when I wear that kippah head covering at a Kids for Peace meeting surrounded by Christian youth, um, Muslim youth, and different, different faith traditions, I, I have this like resounding sense of pride in my own Jewish identity, knowing that I am representing this lineage, I am representing this tradition, um, and that there are people in this room who, um, who care to hear what I have to say about it. Yeah, that's, yeah, so that I, I think in lots of ways, I mean, I was at a, I was at a meeting with, uh, with a lot of Muslim leaders about four years ago, and, uh, and one of them said something that stuck with me, that we don't really know our own faith until we engage with people of different faiths, until we engage in this, like, this deeper conversation. Um, but I, I know as a kid, um, I, I grew up in a, in a very, uh, very small town where, you know, as a Lutheran, I thought, we thought that the Catholics were, were kind of a little bit out there, you know, and, uh, and, that, and that intermarriage between actually Lutherans and Catholics was considered a pretty big deal. It was actually a topic of discussion. And so there, there wasn't really a sense that, that, that there's a deeper truth to which, um, to which um, we're all aspiring. We're all trying to reaching for. It was like we sort of have it and those other people don't. It was this sort of a team, team sport. And, and if I can just share this story quickly once, uh, a, a woman once walked up to my dad in the cafe and said to him, Bruce, do you love Jesus? And like he was going to have to show her how much he loved Jesus in some way. And he recognized that, that there was something competitive happening. And so he, he, he did something which is done at all of our basketball games, which is one town says, we've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? And then the other town does it louder until people get tired of it. Yeah. And so my dad said, well, I, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? And because there's this kind of competitiveness that, that gets into this whole uh, idea of groupness, right? And so I, I wonder, like, have you all ever experienced some of that competitiveness? And how do you deal with it when it emerges? <laughs> and Hannah, I'll, I'll, I'll point to you on this one. Yes, we have. Um, this is surprising, actually, to a lot of people. Um, the hardest faith traditions or faith conversations that we have had to we navigate in Kids for Peace are very, very often among people of the same tradition. Because when people walk into Kids for Peace, they're walking in with this willingness at least to consider what it might be like to learn about somebody else, right? There's this kind of basic you know what you're getting yourself into because you read our website, right? Like you, you know that by stepping in the door there's some level of learning you're going to have to do about somebody who is other to you. Um, however, what you don't often fail to realize is that um, the people who you think are the same often are very much not. And their way of practicing their tradition and their experience of practicing their tradition um, is very different than the way that you might experience or practice or speak about your tradition. Um, and that is often offensive, right? It is hard and challenging to look at someone who is supposed to be the same and to realize that in fact it is it is okay and it is real that your experience is different and my two favorite very quick stories about this are yeah. that many years ago at camp um, I was off doing something and I get this call on the walkie-talkie that I need to come to the chapel like I have to come right now it doesn't matter what else I'm doing I need to be in the chapel and so I'm walking to the chapel, like, who, who punched somebody, like, who did what, you know, I have no idea what I'm about to walk into. Lo and behold, in the chapel, 
all of the Jewish youth are crying. Almost every single one of them. They're sitting in a circle and they're all in tears and they can't figure out why at their 12, right? But they cannot, cannot fathom. Why does your Jewish practice look so different than mine? Wow. Why is it that the way that we practice in our countries, in our cities, in our houses, in our synagogues, why is it so different? And wow. how do we navigate that? And, um, you know, obviously I am more correct than you are. We need to do it my way, right? And how do, how do we navigate this entire 14-day experience allowing different facets of Judaism to show up in different spaces? And um, we got there four hours later. Um, everyone had stopped crying and everyone had, had kind of come to this epiphany moment of realizing that it was okay, that our practices looked different, and we could even, in fact, do those alongside one another in the same space and in the same room um, without giving up anything of who we were. Um, wow. So th those, those kids actually, like, despise that story. They hate it. I tell it all the time, and they're now juniors in high school. Um, and they're like, it wasn't as dramatic as you make it sound. It was as dramatic as I make it sound. <laughs> um, the, the other story that I will tell really quickly, it's also with a few of our Jewish youth, but um, this, this young man named Nathan came down from um, um, Shabbat morning prayers um, wearing zitzit. These are the like fringes that often Jewish people will wear. Um, they're like prayer prayer shawl fringes that you see um, wear, being worn. And I was like, you don't, those are not yours. Like you don't own those. They're not part of your practice. And he looks at me in the most nonchalant way and says, Eviatar took them off and is letting me wear them for the day because I've never done that before. Eviatar was an Orthodox Jewish boy from Jerusalem who wear, wears them daily, not just on Shabbat, um, but was willing to take them off and let Nathan wear them for the day because he had never experienced what that might be like. And Eviatar thought that maybe that would be cool at camp for Nathan to be able to see what that was like to have those on. Um, and it didn't bother him that in that one moment, he was able to give that to his friend um, and to give up wearing them for a few hours to allow him to experience that. And it was to them, like I was like crying in the office and they're like, this is very dramatic. Like, it's not that big a deal. And, and because it's normal for them. Like, it's normal to share those things and to try that. And if that's all we achieve is to make that type of thing normal, um, I'm, I'm happy. Wow. Jacob or Tallulah, have you had any experiences with, uh, you know, challenges around uh, pe engaging people uh, in the same tradition uh, as part of your Kids for Peace experience? You know what, um, in terms of like my personal engagement with those types of conversation, um, our differences have, have never really reached the, the, the boiling point of, of sort of the, the, the tension that, that Hannah was describing in that type of dialogue. Um, and um, I mean, I, I, I know everyone, everyone sort of engages in those conversations a different way, but I would say from the very beginning, um, of, of me joining Kids for Peace. So those conversations have been structured very, very intentionally. Um, and I, I actually haven't really felt that type of, that type of tension. Yeah, how about you, Tallulah? Um, I think that I have certainly experienced uh, seeing other people's faith and wondering how to like reflect that back on myself. So if I think about my first experience wearing a headscarf when we went to observe a June. Oh no. I think we lost Tallulah. I think, I think Tallulah's uh, video um, froze. And so we're gonna, we're gonna continue with Hannah until we get Jake. Hey, there's, there's Tallulah. Keep, keep going Tallulah, we can hear you now. We're having a human moment. <laughs> I so keep jumping out, yeah. sorry. It's fine, don't worry about it. Just uh, go ahead and start your story over again. Um, so I was just saying, my first experience going, wearing a headscarf and going to observe a Juma prayer, 
I had I had obviously seen people wearing headscarves, like Muslim girls wearing headscarves, and I didn't really know what that was like. I didn't totally understand it, but I was like, you do your thing, you know? It's not my thing, but I'll observe. Um, and I found it to be really powerful um, just to have like a physical change that you go through when you enter a space of worship that's so visible like that. Um, and it certainly made me think back on the way that I prevent present myself in um, faith spaces in a different way than I had ever thought about it before. Interesting. Interesting. I know for myself, uh, the first time I went into a mosque, um, you know, it, I, I was, I was uh, surprised at how um, challenged I was, not in my head, you know, but, but really kind of in my guts about the whole thing. And, and I, um, but but then I, as I was sitting there and I was I was I was doing my own prayers while they were praying at first and listening to the sermon, I had this very profound sense of of God's presence, the same as I get when I'm in many many other worshiping communities, you know, and uh, and it was uh, it was something that I knew, right? I knew theologically that you know that God's not. Is, doesn't have like a McDonald's or McChristian's, you know, logo on God, <laughs> you know, but, um, but it was, it was really a, a profound moment for me. And of course it came for me much later in life than it came for you two. Yeah. I think the experiencing the experience of seeing people like wear their faith on the outside was very different for me and uh, not something that I had experienced. Like, yes, I went to church and I was a Christian, but not something that like my casual friends knew and just this presenting yourself. It was very obvious that you were a person of faith was wildly different than anything that I knew. And so it was really interesting. Well, is, is part of that because roughly 80% of the population in Western Washington does not attend a kind of faith community? I think definitely. Um, I, a couple of my close friends um, outside of Kids for Peace um, go to church regularly. Um, not a lot of, I don't have friends to identify religiously as Jewish outside of Kids for Peace. Um, they may identify culturally as Jewish, but um, not so much religiously. And I think that it's really easy to, to imagine that there are no young people that are people of faith. Um, in spaces like this where it seems like more people um, don't align themselves with a certain religion. So it was just to have people so publicly align and be like, okay, maybe I could also do this was really formative for me when I was younger. That's really interesting. So I, and I found something very similar for myself that there are aspects of, of other traditions and the way people live them out that actually kind of awaken um, uh, a, a kind of, uh, as, as other authors have said, a kind of a holy envy uh, about uh, kind of awakening a certain, a, a certain part of my own tradition, which I hadn't noticed before, uh, simply because I've engaged with someone, someone different. Um, have, have, has any, have any of the rest of you experienced sort of something like that, uh, like, like Tallulah has? I think it definitely for me, for me, this work, um, you know, I, I really began my dive into interfaith work as a, as a graduate student. And so I was, you know, I was um, into my 20s a bit before I, before I really started to, started to do that. And um, I think it, it had always been intriguing to me. Um, but, you know, I grew up in a very small town in Southwest Virginia, and it just wasn't, present. There was not, that was not something that was visible in, in the community. Um, and if it was, it was, it was put away pretty quickly. Um, and I think the, the idea that when you speak about your identity in the world, that can be something that is so visible and, and it is something that can also be acceptable, um, is, is a very different, um, narrative than, than some that I experienced, um, even as Christian growing up. And, and I think seeing others who are who are even so much more willing than I am to be so outwardly, visibly um, a person of faith is is um, inspiring and and makes me definitely not, not question, but definitely makes me consider and and think more more critically about the way that I choose to express faith express faith in the world. And um, I'm going to out Tallulah a little bit. I don't even know if she remembers this, but many years ago. 
Um, I was in a small group discussion with her and, and um, a couple of other um, of youth, and it happened to be that all of us were Christian. That was not the intention, but it happened to be how we divided. And um, I remember Tallulah and one of um, her peers just being very quiet and then suddenly saying they were really excited that they got to have these conversations um, that day because living in a place like Seattle, they weren't necessarily very willing to be outwardly a person of faith. Um, and it was, and I had, that had never occurred to me that even, um, that anyone would, would not be willing to do that um, in a place like Seattle, as you said, you know, Terry, that just is not a place that, that attends and that is, is a part of um, more organized religious tradition. And um, yeah, so it definitely makes me consider new things every day. So um, I, we have kind of a, we have one question in the Q and A I, I want to get to just for a minute, and that's you know when when the when the participants in the summer program return to their countries, uh, do individuals st you know stay in touch with each other, and is that like intentional or is that uh, sort of just something that kind of happens, Hannah? Oh, I'm not going to answer that question. Okay, <laughs> I can okay. definitely answer it. So can Jacob. Go for it, you guys. Um, if I if I can start for a moment. Yeah. Um, group chats, group chats, group chats. Um, we have had some of the craziest group chats you've ever seen over the last couple of years, um, where we have um, this like coalition of of students from from Jerusalem who identify as Muslim, who identify as Christian, as Jewish, and then from America, from from all over the states, um, and together. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll engage in topics, we'll support each other. Someone will be like, hey, I'm leading this project in that community. Um, how, how can we work on this together? Wow. Um, and other times we'll just, we'll just send lots and lots of emojis and lots and lots of articles. Wow. Yeah, group, ch I, that's what I was gonna say. Is we have really large group chats that <laughs> we started when we were you know, all in DC together. There's a Global Institute group chat and it starts as like, hey, my group is leaving to go to this restaurant right now if anyone wants to come with us, just FYI. And then it becomes this thing where I was writing a speech for a Kids for Peace fundraiser and I messaged the group chat and one of my friends in Jerusalem sent me a list of great um, speech hooks that I should use. And I ended up using one of them, kind of, you know, saying that it was from my group chat as the speech hook for my fundraising speech. You know, these things that devolve into just like, we're just chatting, just random things pop into our heads and I send it on over to Nadav or whatever. That's really great. It is, it is very much just grassroots, like they figure it out. We will sometimes offer ways of connection that, you know, sure. it's like 50-50. It's like sometimes they bite, sometimes they don't. <laughs> adults are, are not welcome in, the, in those spaces. Um, but I will say I am very careful about who I tell what information because I have no idea who is in what group chat with who. Um, and so they, and they often also connect across cohorts. And so even if people were not at camp together, um, they have, they have found a way of being connected for one reason or another. Um, and so there's, there's connection even across those cohorts and across those grade levels. Wow. So, yeah, my so yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say one of my best Kids for Peace friends is in a different cohort than I, and we didn't meet until her second and my third year of Kids for Peace. Um, but, but I have one because oh yeah, we're both in this Kids for Peace thing, and Hannah was like, they'd make great roommates. Doesn't even matter, you know where she lived in Vermont for a while, like completely opposite sides of the country, but just find our way together somehow. So, so one of the, the big questions that, that I, I hear happening out there is how are we going to live together on this planet given our cultural differences? Uh, what do you think your experience here has taught you about, about how to do that? Yeah, I can actually start with this one. Um, we've talked a lot about um, forming like personal connections um, and relating to each other on a personal level to overcome personal differences. Um, but I think it's also very important to recognize um, that more coordinated action 
is sometimes necessary on the community level in order to address more uh, the, some of the societal divides um, we, we see in politics and beyond. And if I could maybe introduce an example of this into the conversation, um, when a few years ago, um, President Trump placed a travel ban um, on, a, on a number of majority Muslim countries, um, there was it was a lot of um, there was a lot of feelings that this was this was based on Islamophobia and, and reigniting some of those tensions in our society. Um, so, as a Kids for Peace um, community, some individuals um, we we went to attend a rally on the court steps of the Seattle the um, the, the the steps of the Seattle courthouse. Um, and together we, we, we rallied with, um, as allies with, with many of our friends um, in the Muslim community as, um, as they led this um, charge against, um, uh, against some of these um, Islamophobic narratives. Yeah, and I, I, I think I was there with you at that same event. I remember Hannah being there. And uh, so I didn't know the two of you at the time, but we were all there together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any, anything from you, Tallulah, or Hannah? Um, about living I, together with our cultural differences. I said this earlier, but I just love people. And I think that as soon as you make those personal connections, and you realize that, like, you can love the same books and be interested in the same animals, no matter who you are and where you live. Those little things end up creating the, the foundation for the really important work of bonding together despite cultural differences. I think one of the things just that I'll add briefly that we talk a lot about in Kids for Peace is the um, the importance of simultaneously building deep lasting personal relationships while also in everything that you do choosing to speak differently about um, other others in the world and choosing to use language that is inclusive and uplifting and is um, celebrating the diversity and the uniqueness and the and the wisdom that others bring um, and and the learning that we can have from their experiences. And I think we as, as an organization and, and in the way that we, we think um, within our programs and our process, as we talked about earlier, is really around the idea that um, one by one by one by one, you are building these relationships that are combating systemic stereotypes and systemic, you know, systemic racism and injustice in the world. Um, and if one by one by one by one, you're doing that, every single one of those people is also going somewhere else and choosing to do that because they have now had an experience and they have learned and they know differently about the way that they can speak about others in our community. And something that Tulula's friend Katie, who she just talked about, um, said recently to, to me that was, um, I thought very profound, was the idea that um, when you sit down at the table, it is not because you are willing to say that you are wrong. It is because you're willing to say that you are going to listen and that the other person deserves the respect and dignity given to them that you are going to listen. Um, and not just listen so you can tell them why they're wrong, but listen so that you can understand what they mean. Um, and I think that if, if, kid, if kids leave Kids for Peace knowing nothing else, I think that is something that is just completely embedded in who they are. Um, and we need giant sweeping change um, around the issues in our world, um, but it starts with single people and it starts with small groups of people and it starts with regions and cities and neighborhoods and communities who are willing to sit down at the table. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting then that, that you know, as, as some people of faith have said that they're, their own faith tradition has been an important source of strength and and perspective to be able to lead social you know social change uh, to to address systemic you know racism and and injustice. Um, but it, it, it's also striking me tonight, 
as we're talking that that being part of a faith tradition and engaging with people of other traditions is actually really also an important place to, to learn some skills and then to find additional strength for that kind of work. So, so Hannah, I'm wondering, um, what are some of the, Hannah, this is for all three of you, uh, what are some of your hopes for, for Kids for Peace in the future and, and what it's going to be doing? I can start if you want, but, but I want to know what you guys think also. Um, so um, one, of the, one of the hopes that I have for Kids for Peace in the future is that we can um, continue to do the work of sharing our story and of sharing the wisdom and the learning of, of these youth who are here and, and all of their peers um, in a way that um, allows others to see see the beauty in it. And I think, and, and to share those stories in a way that um, people are willing to consider and listen to. I think often this type of work is, is dismissed by people who are not um, even remote, really interested or not willing to, to do it. And and I wonder a little bit about how to how to tell the story in a way that, that has, makes them listen a little bit harder um, and, and to do that work. And um, my big, you know, hairy, scary goal for Kids for Peace um, in the next few years is to, um, is to really take a foothold um, across, across the world, but especially across the United States as we continue to navigate um, turbulent times, I guess is what we can call them in this moment. Um, yes. And, and just to really be able to provide a platform and a space for youth to do exactly what Jacob and Tulula were talking about initially, space to be vulnerable, space to mess up, space to, to build relationships, and then, um, you know, be able to turn around together um, and, and act differently and, and show up differently in communities around the country and around the world. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then, you know, you, you all can still an answer that question if you want to, but I'm just real curious, uh, what your how how your experience um, at Kids for Peace has sort of shaped the kind of way you're going to engage the world uh, in in the future. As you graduate and go off to college, I know. I would love to talk about that. I think because Kids for Peace has changed so much what I have wanted to do um, for most of my I don't know my life until I was 11, so not that many years, but for a really long time, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be, I wanted to work from home. I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to be kind of avoid people as much as possible. Um, and then I joined Kids for Peace, um, super anxious little 11 year old. Um, and by the end of, I mean, not the end of my Kids for Peace career, I'm gonna be involved forever. But um, by the end of this six year period, I'm moving halfway across the country to go to college. Um, I've decided to major in political science, not English or writing or history or anything. Solitary, you know, like I've, I've learned to be myself in a different way. Jacob, anything you wanna share? In terms of like the dream for Kids for Peace, um, I think it's important to recognize that having these conversations forming this community um, is incredibly valuable, um, but the strength um, uh, of this group, um, I think can definitely be measured um, by how we, what we do with it, what actions we take um, be beyond us into the greater community. And um, in terms of like the future of Kids for Peace, um, I am looking forward to see how, how our fellow um, youth leaders um, come to engage, engage with, with the, the world we live in and continuing to lead advocacy efforts like I-940 or engage in, politi in, um, in campaigns like Families Belong Together and really take concrete actions to help support the community we live in. Thank you very much. You know, so we're, we're nearing the end of our time. I just want to thank Tallulah, Jacob, and Hannah, all of you for being with us. Um, 
look forward, uh, Hannah, to more partnership with you um, over the years here. And I know we're going to get together pretty soon and talk about how we can work together across Washington State and beyond. And uh, to all of you who are listening tonight, we're just grateful you're all here. Um, next week, we're going to have Tom Aketa from Den Show in conversation with us to talk about some of the dehumanizing language that's been going on around the coronavirus and some other things. You can find out more about what we're doing at PathToUnderstanding.org. Remember that Challenge 2.0, uh, hosted by Jeff Renner, is on Sunday mornings at 7.30 on MeTV, and you can find that on our YouTube channel at Pass to Understanding on, you, on, uh, on YouTube. We're still in transition a bit on Facebook. Uh, we're still at the Tracy Levine Center, but eventually that, that Facebook page will become Pass to Understanding. Also know that we have our Facts or Fear campaign uh, working to counteract anti-Muslim bigotry. And that is that you can find more, out more about that at www.factsoreffear.org. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Mm -hmm.